Hey all, I'm Amos from Moog Music, and I'm here with another live stream where we will be showing off some sounds and showcasing the work of one of our sound designers. And today I have with me Suit and Tie Guy, proprietor of STG Sound Labs and KnobCon, and he has been working with us closely as a beta tester and a sound designer as we've been in the final stages of Moog One development. And uh, we've brought him here today to share some of the sounds that he's created, talk about what went into the sound design and the, sort of the thoughts and process behind them. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy. Eric, thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. This is the first time we've been on camera together. It is, oddly and, enough. And we've been friends for 12 years. Well, this is really cool. <laughs> uh, cool. So, uh, hello out there. We're 20 minutes into the future with the Moog One, and I'm going to show you some sounds that I made. Uh, this one is uh, the, s the simplest sound that I'm going to show you. Uh, basically, I was doing a thing where I wanted to make this ocean sound effect, okay? Because I was listening to a Susan Chiani record called the Seven Waves. And there's this particular sound that she made in the track two, the second wave, which is a, a white noise thing, but there's Multi there's a, there's a, a wave like this, and then there's the sound of a wave crashing like that. So I'm going to just go ahead and play this for you. And then I'll describe what's going on in the sound. kind of a self-playing patch. You can just let it run. I love how it just keeps evolving. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need to do some controller stuff with this uh, so you can change the, mm -hmm. uh, change the speed. And oh, that's right. Yeah. Lots of controllers to map to it. So uh, that is just white noise or pink noise um, going through both of the filters on the Moog One. Uh, the sound that's doing this is, uh, is the, the state variable filter. Um, and there's a spacing on the filters. Uh, they're in bandpass mode. Um, and so you're not just getting like one pass band of the white noise, you're actually getting two because they're spaced and they're in parallel. Um, it was one of the really neat features of this thing is the state variable filter is not just one state variable filter, but two. And they can be in series or parallel. And uh, the spacing really uh, lets you get some, I mean, that, mm -hmm. that sounds way more interesting than just white noise through a pass band. Oh, for sure. You know? Yeah, because you've got multiple peaks and you can move them around mm -hmm. together yeah. or independently. And then, you know, like, I would like to get into, like, vowel sounds and things like that, but I haven't got oh, to they're that in there. yet. <laughs> oh, good, 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 mm -hmm. good, cool. Now, the other sound was this crashing sound, okay? And that's the white noise also going through the ladder filter. Um, the ladder filter is being controlled by a looping envelope. Uh, it's the filter envelope set to loop and um, uh, basically every okay. 10 seconds or so it gives you a crash. And um, then I just used an LFO. Um, let's see, which LFO did I use? Yeah, yeah, I just used LFO2 um, for the state variable filter. Uh, so yeah, I, and there's no effects on the sound. Uh, you're just you're just hearing the noise. I'm gonna let this play a little bit, and I'm gonna tweak some knobs. Sure, go for it. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna I'm actually gonna remove the LFO on. Um, the, the this sound, the state variable sound, and I'm going to sweep it around a little bit. I'm also going to change the change length of time. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm moving over to just the state variable sound. Go ahead and change the spacing. Ooh. 
Yeah, it's cool hearing those two different state variable filter cells moving independently of each other. There is a lot of bass on that there is. filter, holy cow. Nice. So uh, the next sound I want to talk about is a complicated sound. Awesome. Which is also kind of simple in the sense that it's just a pad, but there's a lot of motion to it. Um, I'm calling it, it's called the shore leave pad. Waves, shore leave, there's a theme here. So I'm gonna just play a chord sequence. I'm gonna be using the hold function, which is uh, a really neat thing. Um, that uh, basically you can play a chord, it'll just hold it. And then you can play another chord, it'll just hold it. It's really neat, I've wanted this for years. <laughs> Now, I've got the mod wheel routed to what would be called a crescendo pedal on a pipe organ. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so that's. Um, Tell us only a little bit about all the yeah, things. Yeah, that yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's changing. talk about like uh, this stuff. Okay, so there's two oscillators um, on this patch. Uh, there's a sawtooth wave on oscillator two, and then a narrow pulse on oscillator one. And what happens in this modulation wheel function right here? The modulation wheel is doing several things at once. Um, the first thing it's doing is it's actually increasing an amount of LFO, very slow LFO, into oscillator one, okay? So like, as you're bringing in the mod wheel, then the pitch variance between this oscillator and this oscillator will increase. Uh, and it's also bringing in the amplitude of this right of, here. Of oscillator one? Right, okay. right, yeah. right. So like when, Oscillator one and two are in most tune, mm -hmm. uh, then you can barely hear it. And then as oscillator two grows in amplitude, then it's differential with oscillator, uh, sorry, oscillator one or oscillator, mm -hmm. oscillator one, right? Yep. Yeah, it gets anyway. louder yeah. and more detuned. Yeah. <laughs> it gets louder and more detuned, nice. right? Um, and then also, um, I've got an LFO on the ladder filter, um, which is also increased by the mod wheel. That. And then um, I'm also, you're, you're actually hearing both filters. So the, um, uh, the mod wheel is also increasing the filter cutoff on the state variable filter as well. Let's see what the balance is. Oh, it's about 50 50. So, so this is just the ladder filter. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it's sweeping that one too a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. 
and then this is the um, state durable filter. And it's more it's subtle. Not, yeah, 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 yeah. It's very subtle. So it's also increasing the release time on uh, the amplitude envelope. Oh, nice. So, so when you're when it's very light, then you know you can you have more articulation in the sound. It's even more pad-like, yeah. And oh, yeah. then, as you bring it in, then it. Oh yeah, more that's a big a, change. Right, right, right. Um, so you're not just a, yeah. And then we also have some effects as well, um, using two instances of the stereo delay because it's my favorite effect. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good one. The stereo delay is this really cool effect. I'm not sure if you've seen the previous uh, live stream where they probably talked about this, but I'm going to talk about it again because I really like this effect. It's a stereo delay where the left and right channel are independent uh, with independent time and feedback and their own independent modulators. Mm -hmm. So you can get an extremely wide sound out yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, so. Well, great. Well, hey, let's hear another sound. Okay. Um, now, this is another, we're going to go back to historical sound. This is uh, a patch that I call Tomita Whistle 1973. So, uh, if you'll forgive me, um, I'm going to uh, I'm try to do this. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so it's really uh, a <laughs> classic. Thank you. Yeah, it's really important uh, whenever you're trying to ape the uh, the soloing style of. Anyone that used a modular synthesizer, like uh, you know, a modular Moog, like Keith Emerson or Tomita, is that they always had their left hand on the glide knob, mm -hmm. which is why it being here is so fantastic that it's you didn't shove the glide knob right. up no, here. It's, it's really a performance it's right, control, yeah. right there, right there. So um, there's also uh, let's see, Got some vibrato in there. Is that on the aftertouch? No, no, oh, not um, on this one. That's that it. is. There's two versions. I made two versions of the sound. One where the vibrato, the vibrato comes in with aftertouch. But Tomita used, uh, what the way he made the sound mm -hmm. was he used pink noise through a 904 low pass filter in full resonance. And then used the uh, 911A and the 911 uh, as a, uh, uh, to control a 902 VCA that had whatever oscillator he was using for the, the LFO. Mm. And I originally, when I made this patch, I had the LFO too fast, and Gene Stopp told me, oh, you gotta slow it down. And then he dialed it in to where he thought it sounded right, mm -hmm. and it was like a speed I never would've used myself. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, it, it, I love this. This is. So is that being done uh, with essentially with the, uh, the filter resonance? Or is, that, is this an oscillator? producing the actual whistle tone? Um, okay, so I actually tried both, mm -hmm. and I couldn't tell the difference. Cool. So on, on this, I'm actually using, uh, I'm using a filter oh, a triangle. triangle, yeah. Yeah, which is, mm -hmm. you know. You still get two great whistles. It nice sounds pure, like nice a sine wave. Yeah. It sounds exactly like mm -hmm. a filter in self-resonance, but Amazing. it's easier to control. For so. sure. Um, and uh, something else I'd like to point out is it's also, it's also useful for uh, Okay, it looks like someone in the chat channel is asking about the thumb drive that's currently in the back of the one. And uh, this, is, this is actually because Eric was designing all of these sounds on his own Moog One and saved his entire user setup as what we call a user space, which is a way that you can save the entire workspace, you know, all of your presets, all of your settings, uh, you know, the whole experience of using your instrument. You can export to a thumb drive and go to any other Moog One and stick in the thumb drive and import your user space and then it's just as though you're working on your own instrument from home or from your studio if you're traveling. 
So uh, Eric's user space is on that thumb drive, and he loaded it up, and he was able to step up to this instrument, which is the different one than he'd been programming on, and he's totally at home. Everything's right where he left it. So uh, that's what that's doing there. I mean, if it's really bothering the chat, then I can just pull it out and put it in my pocket. <laughs> All good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, cool. Moving right along, uh, there's another question about all the knobs and switches sending MIDI CCs. Uh, we're working on the MIDI implementation now. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll have more info about that uh, you know, when the manual is published and uh, going forward. Um, a lot of them are sending CCs right now. I think there may be more physical knobs than there are available non-reserved MIDI CCs. So for total coverage, um, we'll, we'll have to use uh, NRPN. Uh, MIDI messages because there are 16,000 of those, so we can actually map the entire parameter space to them. But, uh, yep, more MIDI info is a coming. All right, All moving right. right along. Yep, so I, uh, I was definitely, I was asked to tell some personal stories, and this sound. Don't get too personal, we I'm are live. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> I'm not gonna, don't worry. Carry the, on. The, the code's come, staying on, All right. staying on. Um, but anyway, anyway, so this sound is called Cool Piano Dude, and it's a piano sound. Um, and it's named Cool Piano Dude because uh, this is my prop, the one prop that I brought. If you've ever seen this t-shirt, it's named after that t-shirt. So. Always asking. You got all these uh, synthesizers. Can any of them make a piano sound? such tonal variety to it. There's really a lot going on there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this sound started out as uh, me trying to make the uh, Gordon Reed JX10 uh, piano sound. And from the Synth Secrets? Yes, from the Synth Secrets series on Sound on Sound, in Sound on Sound magazine. And um, I, uh, I couldn't tell if I was actually getting there because I don't even know what a JX10 sounds like. It is hard to read a description of a sound <laughs> and tell if you're nailing that sound, but it is really fascinating to see all of the techniques that are unpacked there. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I got the sound going and I changed some stuff and it wound up sounding like a cross between a Wurlitzer and my friend Matt Chadra's uh, Rhodes. He voices it. He's got a Mark I, he refuses to use a Mark II. Because uh, uh, basically, the, he tries to voice it as he says, like George Duke. Okay. Um, it, apparently, it doesn't the way this has a Rhodesy yeah, vibe for sure. Yeah, yeah. So like this. It I like how it does has some of that little growl when you dig into it. That's one of my favorite Rhodesy things. It's like sweet at low velocities and a little more aggressive. Yeah. Sounds. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah. I mean, no, you know, no, no, no. You're right. You're yeah. right. You're right. You're Get right. me a okay. cocktail, and I'll sit back, and we can just uh, I'll just listen all day. But we got some more. Oh, oh right. Yeah, that's more cool mm, stuff. Yeah, to yeah. Okay. So 
It's another historical sound. Uh, there's two people that are the reason why I'm into Moog synthesizers, and they are Keith Emerson and Isao Tomita. And here's a Keith Emerson sound. Um, It's a little not exactly the same as he played it, but uh, I had to change the notes for copyright reasons. That's right, that's right. So, uh, now this sound, I've never actually been able to make this sound with a synthesizer before, mm -hmm. because it's so complicated. Uh, Keith Emerson's modular synthesizer had uh, a static patch, and then the presets changed the values on that patch. Mm -hmm. Part of his static patch was that the, uh, the sine wave from oscillator one was routed to a final output mixer post-filter pre-VCA. Mm -hmm. So when you hear, there's two components of this sound. So here's the, uh, here's the whistle. Whoa. What? Other way, maybe. No, I'm on the wrong synth. Oh, hey. Okay. okay, so that's, the reed, uh, the reedy sound mm -hmm. that's uh, an octave underneath, and then this is the whistle. And I made that whistle by using the state variable filter in a bandpass mm -hmm. mode. So um, now there's another uh, aspect of the sound too. Um, well, first of all, uh, towards the end of the solo, you hear um, um, you hear this. I'm not quite there yet, mm -hmm. but there's like basically a, uh, there's a sawtooth LFO modulation on mm -hmm. the filter. Now there's another part though. There's actually two tracks on the keyboard solo from, from the beginning. And uh, the second part is this, this like woo 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 sound, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> what I did was I, I programmed it on the second voice, and you can bring it in with the touchpad, and it just, yeah. you just press the touchpad, and it just comes in. And then you can move the modulation around, like. So you're using the pressure and the XY I'm on the pad? I'm using pressure and XY. Nice, yeah. <laughs> um, so that was from the beginning, and um, I'm still working on the sound, but hopefully, like, you know, in the shipping product, it'll be. We'll dial it on in. Uh, now, this, tr okay, so, Ooh, like something is really cool about this thing is a feature called the wave angle, okay? So this is actually a, uh, you can actually modulate the shape of the oscillators, okay? So in the sawtooth wave, you're able to actually change the reset time of the oscillator core. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the triangle wave, it's more interesting. You can, you can actually shape it from a sawtooth to a triangle to a ramp continuously. And it's perfect. It, it does what it does. It does what it is supposed to do. But it says on the tin, so as they say. So I uh, made this sound where uh, there is no filter, and it's just kind of showing. And the, I've got a couple of sounds uh, like this, but this is the first one I'll play. This is called Wave Angle Bass. Let's hear it. Um, So that, that harmonic change as the sound uh, evolves, that's, actually, that's modulating the wave angle? Correct. Very cool. On all three VCOs at once, and they're in a uh, traditional, uh, oh, okay, so. Sounds I really organic, the, it's, uh, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so let's play with the, uh, the way the wave angle is controlling things is with the modulation EG. So let's tweak that a little sure, bit, okay? Yeah. So people can hear. Okay, I've dialed the DK all the way back. 
Uh, my oscillators are tuned to 16, 16, and 32 mm -hmm. because that's the way Keith Emerson tuned his mini Moog for bass. It's a good reason. But uh, another way to another another way to do it is just to do just, octaves. Yep. You know. Mm -hmm. That there's no there's no filter sweeping. That's just harmonic sweeping at That's the core just oscillator. Yeah, harm, you know, <laughs> it's That's a cool trick. It, it's really it's really something else. So um, there's another uh, here's another wave angle bass sound. This is a, more of a pluck. Thanks. You can hear the wave angle changing slowly over time. Yeah. Uh, now, something important, when you're modulating wave angle, you're going to want to use the linear function of the envelope generators. Uh, the linear curves uh, will give you uh, more... Uh, exponential curves really work better for filter sweeps. Mm -hmm. yeah, but for audio, when, you're yeah. doing, when you're doing timbre things, having access to linear envelopes is gigantic. Yeah, um, yeah. So... All right, and uh, yeah, while you're going through that, it uh, looks like we're catching up on a few questions. Uh, if you have any long drony space sounds, if you could play us out with one in the near future, that would be awesome. Oh. <laughs> we're running, not, I mean, I think we got to maybe time for one more and then some long drony space sounds. Other questions, can you choose different curves for the aftertouch sensitivity? Um, right now, aftertouch sensitivity is, uh, is essentially fixed, but uh, you know, all the hooks are in there. Um, you know, that's, that's something that we're looking at. We can't. Uh, you know, we can't promise too much more than we are shipping right now, but, um, oh, wait a minute. Actually, hang on. I was, I was Transform? Yes, yes, absolutely. I was overanalyzing the question. The answer is, of course, because it's a mod source, and the mod matrix has extensive capabilities for you to not only dial in exactly the amount of a mod source that you're applying, but you can also use transforms, which give you different curves uh, between the, the mod source value and the destination. So yes, because it's a mod source, like any other mod source, you can totally tweak the amount and the curve that it is, that it, you know, by which that value is applied to its destination. Um, for each routing. For each routing, exactly, independently. So the same mod source can have one curve as it's applied to one parameter and a different curve as, as it's applied to another parameter, and you get all that stuff happening simultaneously. So you're not just stuck with one aftertouch curve for the whole thing. Nope, you can have a different one for every destination that aftertouch is affecting at a given time. So. Uh, Long drony space sounds? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's a here's a sound. Uh, basically, this is also I, I got a couple of long droning space sounds. This is the first one because it ties into the wave angle. This is called wave angle pad. So uh, it's also got uh, some mod wheel stuff here. So um, bringing in these two VCOs as well as increasing the wave angle modulation from the LFOs. Now there's uh, got another uh, nice uh, droney sound here. Um, oh, actually, yeah. Um, here's another one.
have any multi-tambral patches in your in this collection by chance? I think you actually demonstrated I did one earlier. Demonstrate the, we just the didn't call patch. it out. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. There yeah. were two timbers in the from the beginning patch. Um, I've been focusing, uh, just like Gary did, on single sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, now I do have another layer sound that I can play, uh, which is uh, let's see how this sounds. Um, this is. I, mean, I guess we could very easily put like a pad on one half of the keyboard and a, you know, the, a piano on the other half. And, oh, let's check this out. So this is a sound based on the Elka Rhapsody 610 patch that Krista Franca used constantly in Tangerine Dream from about 77 to 81. Uh, you can hear this in the first track on Encore. Uh, I make this sound on every keyboard that I play. <laughs> it's like a test. Can yeah. I make this sound on the yeah, keyboard, yeah, yeah. right? So there's two aspects of this sound. Um, so synth synth one is playing is doing this. Okay, and um, that is an extremely simple sound. There's just two instances of uh, pulse, and then um, there's LFO on one of them, and then it's going through a chorus. Mm -hmm. Cool. Which is to simulate the way. The Rhapsody actually had like a, a, there's a, there's a fast chorus generator and then there's a slow chorus generator. So I do one of the chorus generators with pulse width modulation and the second one with a chorus generator. Nice. Now the synth two is using, is, this is the piano sound, okay? Elka, Elka style. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a piano. And then you put them together and... All right. Is the chord hold button the same as a key latch? Um, I would say, I mean, different manufacturers over time have used different terminology. Yeah. I would say basically yes. Like, for example, the same button on the Moog 1 latches the arpeggiator on. And if the arpeggiator is not, well, basically it has the same effect uh, if the question, if key latch means you hold some notes and they last forever, but then if you let go of all the notes and play some new ones, it replaces the old ones, then yes, that's the behavior. And that's really useful when you're arpeggiating, and it's also really useful if you just want to play sustained chords and then switch over to a new chord the next time you play the keys. It's just a very useful performance feature. So let's interpret this question a little bit more. Okay. okay. So basically, like, he's using the term uh, latch. He right? or she. We don't he know. He or she, right. Um, Latch. Now, latch is normally a term you see on an arpeggiator. Mm -hmm. So, in the context of the arpeggiator, the hold button is latch. Yes. But then, when you're not using the arpeggiator, it lets you apply the concept of arpeggiator latch to held chords, which is very different from a, a sustained pedal function. That's right, which you also have. So, we have options. So, um, uh, let's see. This is, uh, so this is, here's another sound. Since I just played that string sound, here's another string sound that also uses a mod wheel thing. Uh, I was watching these uh, videos of Jeff Picaro that someone uploaded to YouTube where he's kind of having a fight with a big shirt uh, while he's also talking about how to make amazing sounds with synthesizers. Really brilliant guy. And he's doing all this stuff with an expander, okay? And um, he's describing how to make string sounds, how to make brass sounds and how to make a bass sound. So like the first thing I did when I came here in July was I'm gonna make those sounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is a sound I've been working on since then. It's, you know, um, so. So on this, uh, basically, like what, what Jeff talks about is he, he uh, accumulating subtleties is the mm -hmm. phrase that he uses. And so he's using multiple, as many LFOs as he can to modulate different aspects of the sound in different ways simultaneously. So what I'm doing here is I'm using all four LFOs and the modulation uh, envelope as an LFO uh, mm -hmm. in looping mode mm -hmm. to 
modulate the uh, different aspects of like each individual pulse width and so frequency mm -hmm. and pulse width and mm -hmm. then also um, using the noise envelope to uh, okay so if we were to oh it got almost like a brass like kind of attack to it or or I guess if you're digging into a bow sort of thing mm -hmm. That's so subtle that I didn't hear it at all when the other oscillators were on. Thank you. That's nice. And it's also controlled by velocity, so oh, you cool. hit it harder and it bends more. Nice. So, um, and then you add this in with all the other stuff. And so, like, I got the sound made, and I was, like, tweaking the sound. I was tweaking the mm -hmm. sound, mm -hmm. right? And trying to find, like, well, what's the best bound? And it's like, well, some people like a lot of modulation. Mm -hmm. Some people don't want a lot. And I was like, oh, hold on a second. I just put the mod wheel on every. So you created the modulations first and then attached a controller to them after the fact. Correct. Nice. Correct. And, and then after I realized that I could do that, then I made all the modulations twice as wide so that like you can just yeah. dial it in the way that you know, you'd want. So like, like. So this, this is the range right here. Yeah. Really got some vintage vibes to it. Hear the dust. <laughs> cool. Uh, there's a request that's come in for an arpeggiator demo. Do you have any arp sounds um, tucked away here? No, no. I mean, you can always pick a nice sound and turn on the arpeggiator. That always works. I actually uh, have um, this. Oh, sounds like it still needs the arpeggiator turned on. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was on the wrong layer. All right. <laughs> Oh, hey. This is multi timbral and arpeggiating. Yeah, I was playing around with that sound earlier. I actually recorded something with it, and it sounded, awesome. yeah. So anyway. Um. All right. Um, if you've got more sounds, or if anybody out there has more questions, uh, I think we might have time for one more. Oh. Ooh, let's hear that. That sounds nice. Yes. Oh wow, it's got some nice stuff going. <laughs> right. So I'm using an uh, aftertouch. Mm -hmm. um, the pressure is bringing in this... Uh, oh, that's just on the attack, that's nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then um, this brings in a fifth. Ooh, yeah. So, so this direction, on the X pad as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This direction changes the pulse width, and then this direction changes the decay. Nice. And then this brings, and then the, that LFO does not is not applied that doesn't affect to the fifth. Correct. Cool, cool. <laughs> okay, and we do have some more questions, and. Are there global LFOs, envelopes, or sequences that can be applied to all three synths? Um, the sequencer can apply a single sequencer. Each layer, each synth has its own sequencer, and that sequencer can affect only the synth that it belongs to, or the same sequence can affect all the synths. So you can have a sequence that affects all the synths. As far as global LFOs and envelopes that can affect all the synths at the same time, I would say not exactly, but kind of. Um, strictly speaking, no. LFOs and envelopes exist on each individual voice card. Each, each voice card is a synthesizer. It's a full mono synth with the entire architecture on it. Uh, however, we have very tight uh, control. We have, the, we have the ability to synchronize things very tightly across and between voices. So it's very easy to set up a single LFO, for example, that will modulate all of the voices the same, the same frequency, the same phase. So you can't tell that it's not a single master LFO. 
And uh, if, for example, you were synchronized to something like a master clock, or if you just set them, probably the best way to get a single LFO uh, to sound, ex or, or envelope to sound exactly the same across multiple layers would be to use clock sync, because you've got a master clock, and all of the envelope times can be synchronized to clock to you know, a certain number of beats of the master clock. And the LFO rate, of course, can be synced to clock. So you probably could, I haven't tried this, you probably could make a two or three layer sound where you had a synchronized envelope or LFO that was doing exactly the same thing to all the layers of that sound. But you would be doing it by tightly synchronizing per voice LFOs or envelopes. Their needs might be addressed by the... <coughs> oh yeah, for example, yeah, again, the panel focus, we have a concept called panel focus where you're pointing all of the knobs and buttons on the panel at one or another of the layers so that your tweaks will only affect that layer and not the others. Or you can select two or three synths at a time, and that means when you reach out and turn a knob, exactly the same knob value is going to be applied to however many synths are in focus. So if you set up an envelope, you know, dial in all of the, uh, the envelope times while all of the synths are in focus, you'll be getting the same envelope settings applied to all the synths. And so when you hit a note, you know, they'll all, they'll, all those envelopes on all the layers will evolve the same. Uh, can you sync the ARP speed to CV? Uh, not Maybe they're right, asking yeah. if you can clock the arpeggiator from a clock. From a CV clock. Yeah, that's uh, probably a, a likelier, clock. you're right, that's a likelier use case than applying a voltage to the rate of the arpeggiator. I mean, you pr could probably program, you could probably route mm -hmm. voltage into this. Right. At some point. Uh, I'm going to say that we cannot promise that that is going to ship in V1.0, but um, it's certainly that Constant. Mm. That phrase has been written down on several spec documents that we will continue to consult as we progress into the future. But uh, as of now, uh, I would say that strictly speaking, a CV clock, you know, anal analog clock uh, clocking the rate of the arpeggiator is not something you can do on the one today. Um, can we play any dark pads or dark sounds? Mm -hmm. Or big bass sounds? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe? Let's try again. <laughs> Now this sound actually. I think that slide and cufflinks might not. Yeah, yeah, be 100% yeah. Sorry compatible. about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, like that, only darker. One, one thing about subtractive synthesis is that you can always make a sound darker until it has no harmonics left because you've turned the filter cutoff all the way down. <laughs> Too dark is. I mean, dar darkness is very easy to obtain. But let's uh, let's do it. Yeah. Oh, take I take a sound I and make it darker. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's. Uh... Ooh. There we go. That's. That's that's getting.
it is. Oh, is it? It is. It's parallel. Oh, or series. 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 That's right. So clever. Yep. That was that was pretty dark, pretty pad like. Fun time. All so how are we doing? Um, pretty good, I think. We might have time for one more sound okay. or one more question if we got some more questions. Yeah, are there in. any questions in the chat room? Okay. Oh, that was fun. Nice jam. Yeah, we should uh, play side transport. It's just you and I, like on one mm -hmm. one. I think just that would be piloting the spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. Uh, I, we could finally fit in the DJ booth. Hey, that's right. Yeah. Um, oh, here's a mm -hmm. here's the the obli <laughs> here's another sound I, I make on every synthesizer mm -hmm. that I own <laughs> is uh, the Lyle Mays lead sound from like the uh, old uh, Pat Metheny record. So uh, this is uh, just two square waves. Uh, he did this on our Oberheim four voice, but we're doing it on the one with the state label filter. Ooh, we can turn that back up. Yeah, we won't. Maybe not quite that much. There. <laughs> I remember that sound. <laughs> it's like it was a very fusiony sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love. That. I was like, I, I've watched Matt Baxley make that. Sound. I made it on my Reface DX. Oh wow! You know, so it's like make it on every synthesizer you have. Mm -hmm. And you can. The, the, one of the things I like about this is let me just add this before we go, is that this synthesizer has a quality which is extremely rare. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know how rare it is, and that is. You can imagine a sound and then just make it. Pretty much the facilities are going to be there. If you think, all right, how do I do X with Y? Yeah. 
you know, it just takes a, you know, you might have to think, you know, two iterations ahead, but yeah, it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Yeah. So it's the most, uh, it's the most powerful analog synthesizer I've ever played. I love this thing. Awesome. All right. Um, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, for everybody who's uh, hung out with us, nerding out on sounds, I sure appreciate it. I hope you heard some things that you liked. And Thank you. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>